This book was owned by a baron. How do I know? He put his book plate in it. But where did the practice of pasting a little piece of paper in your books come from, and why should you care? Follow along to find out. Hello and welcome to a new episode of Bite Sized Book History. I'm your host, Allie Alvis, who you may know better as Book Historia. I'm a book historian and rare book cataloger at antiquarian book dealer Type Punch Matrix. Today I'll be talking to you about those darlings of provenance research, book plates. Book plates, also sometimes known as ex libris, are basically ownership labels of individuals, institutions, or libraries. Ex libris comes from the Latin from the library or from the books. Book plates often contain things like names or personal symbology or coats of arms. But book plates have not always been that simple peel and stick number you can buy at Barnes & Noble. Although people have been writing their names in books from time immemorial, the first book plate as we think of it is this little plaque from 14th century BC. It's the ownership label of Pharaoh Amenhotep III and Queen T of Egypt, and it was likely attached to a box that held scrolls. In the 600s and 700s AD, Chinese and Japanese book owners developed special stamps to indicate book ownership. They were generally limited to the owner's name and occupation, or the name of the shrine library they belonged to. Deluxe Western manuscripts often included the coats of arms of the families who commissioned them usually incorporated into the illuminated borders. The first book plate as we know it, a printed piece of paper pasted into a book as an ownership mark, is one of these two, both from 15th century Germany. My favorite of the two is this one, the Hedgehog of Johannes Knabensberg. It likely dates to the second half of the 15th century and is a play on Knabensberg's nickname, Eagler, the German word for hedgehog. Translated from German, the caption above reads, Hans Eagler, that the hedgehog may kiss you, a spiny threat to those who may borrow the book and fail to return it. Another early book plate features the coat of arms of Brother Hildebrand Brandenburg of Biberach, a Carthusian monk. This also dates from the second half of the 15th century and is a lovely example of a printed but hand-colored woodcut. Why the sudden appearance of book plates in the 15th century? It not only has to do with the rise of Western movable type printing, but with the expansion of personal book ownership. For the majority of the Middle Ages and before, books were tremendously expensive, owned by the nobility, the church, or the very, very rich. They secured their libraries in locked cases or rooms, sometimes with chains to further deter theft. But by the later Western Middle Ages, even before the advent of print, Changes in manuscript production and the rising literacy rates of middle classes meant that more and more people had at least one book in their home. And as movable type became a more viable and cost-efficient technology, libraries grew to unprecedented sizes, and it was simply more efficient to apply a book plate than to add an ownership inscription to every book by hand. Like movable type printing itself, book plates first appeared in Germany and slowly spread across Europe. Notable German artists such as Albrecht Dürer and Leonard Beck were commissioned to design book plates in the early 16th century, starting a long relationship between prominent designers and book plates as a medium. The first French book plates date to the 1520s, and Italy had adopted their use by the mid-1500s. Interestingly, book plates didn't become popular in England until the 1570s. The inverse of a book plate is a supralibros, Latin for on books. This is a tooled crest that usually appears on the cover of a book. These were particularly popular among collectors who had all their books bound in the same style and had their heyday from the mid 16th to the 18th centuries. But book plates were cheaper and easier to produce and apply. By the later 17th century, the design formula for book plates had become pretty standard. A coat of arms with the name below. Aristocrats commissioned book plates of their family crest to be custom engraved. Some book owners even had book plates in a variety of sizes, so their ex libris wouldn't be dwarfed on the end paper of a large folio. Humbler book plates were simply the name of the owner surrounded by typographic ornaments. These were much cheaper to produce, as they could simply be made with movable type that printers already had in stock. The first American book plate is an example of this. It's the book plate of Stephen Day, the printer of the Bay Psalm book, 
and is dated 1642. By the 18th century, this formula had acquired quite a Rococo sensibility, with lush flora and embellishment. These armorial book plates can present quite a challenge to researchers and rare book professionals. As I mentioned, names only appear next to coats of arms sometimes. To a fellow noble or aristocrat, these armorials may have been immediately familiar, but today they can be hard to puzzle out. Blazoning is a good place to start when trying to uncover the identity of a book plate's owner. To blazon is to describe a heraldic achievement, basically a coat of arms, in a formal manner that was established in the Middle Ages. Using this formulaic description, you can look up the armorial in dictionaries of peerage. Wikipedia actually has a great page about blazoning terms, which I have linked in the description. Even experienced rare book professionals can get tripped up when it comes to heraldry, as was the case with this edition of Newton's Optics. This nameless book plate went undescribed for decades. It wasn't until its owner was taking a closer look at his collection in 2021 that he identified it as that of John Musgrave. And when looking closer, the owner noticed the ghost of another book plate below Musgrave's. Sir Isaac Newton's book collection was sold after his death, first to a prison warden named John Huggins, and then to John Musgrave, who pasted his own book plates on top of all of Huggins's. The presence of both of these book plates indicates that this book came from Newton's own library, something that could only be discovered by taking the time to untangle the different coats of arms. In the later 19th and early 20th centuries, the design of book plates diversified greatly. Armorial book plates were still being produced, but more regular people and lending libraries were applying their own book plates to their collections. Book plates became more pictorial, reflecting the personality and interests of their owners, not just their pedigree. Artists from Aubrey Beardsley to Kate Greenaway to M.C. Escher were commissioned to design stylish book plates for collectors. But what happens when the collector becomes the collected? Also in the 19th century, a new type of antiquarianism emerged, the bookplate collector. These early collectors were less interested in the books of historic figures and more interested in their ownership marks and their design. Collectors steamed off or cut out bookplates from their original books and compiled them into scrapbooks or loose sheets such as these. You can see that none of these have any information of what book they were removed from. This one even has the remnants of marbled paper on the back. In the 20th century, bookplate collections shifted from mutilation to exchange, with enthusiasts sending each other unused copies of their own bookplates. Bookplate fans would sometimes commission multiple designs of their own bookplates, just to have something to share with their fellow collectors. And bookplates are still being designed today. Bookseller Simon Beatty wrote a lovely blog about the design process of his own personal bookplate, created by wood engraver Simon Brett. And of course, you can head down to your local bookstore and pick up a pack of your own. That does it for this episode of Bite Sized Book History. This topic was actually suggested by a viewer. If you have any suggestions for future videos, feel free to drop them in the comments below. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and please support me on Patreon. I would very much appreciate it. I'll see you next time, and remember, don't bite your books. Bye.